Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored to welcome to the show from the County of Northern Lights, Alberta, Councillor Kaylin Shug. Kaylin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I, I'm excited for you to be here as well. You're so perky uh, uh, the day we're recording this, and it's really given me a lot of energy because I woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning, so it's great. <laughs> it's the five coffees. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Kaylin, if you've listened to the show, you know the first question, and you're no exception to that first question. So, Kaylin, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Oh, well, how long do we have here? Uh, um, you have an hour. So if I can go okay. grab a coffee to catch up to your five, then let's do it. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so I was born and raised in a family that that was instilled in you. You were a part of your community. You volunteered, you got involved and really a firm belief in your community is what you make it. Um, so I was, you know, grew up with my mom who volunteered for everything. She's currently serving in her fourth term as a municipal counselor in the neighboring community. So we just, you know, do that. And then of course I had two babies of my own. So now I'm a volunteering mom. I sat on a couple of the play school boards and things like that. And we just, it was just something you did. Okay, so my my s traditional follow up to that is was municipal <laughs> politics discussed at the dinner table, but with a yeah. mother who literally is on the council <laughs> in your neighboring community, I'm assuming and I know you should never assume that politics was yeah. discussed at the dinner table. Uh, perhaps more than it should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I grew up my mom has always been politically engaged. She added that to me and I just kind of took it on and I am a political junkie. So this is a natural fit, I think. <laughs> was it federal or provincial politics that was discussed or did you get into the municipal realm? Because we often forget that municipal politics, while it is uh, equal level to some, it is there. Um, it's often the one that we don't talk about because we, there's no party partisanship and the municipal yeah. it's okay. It's John down the street. Who's my mayor or my counselor. Exactly. So um, we're a small town. So you kind of knew who your mayor was. It was kind of like, oh, okay, that's the mayor. <laughs> uh, so I guess growing up, it was more so, you know, provincial, federal, international, you know, you've always got to keep your eye on the United States because you never know. Um, but uh, then once we were kind of older and she ran for her first term for council, then it was like, oh, 
oh, so there's like that going on that's on TV, like at this level. And so then that's when it kind of started for, for me anyways. But So do you, do you mind me asking when she first got into elected politics? Were you still like, were you still in her house or yeah, were you I was, living? Yeah, I was still living at home. Yeah, don't quote me on that. But I, think <laughs> I was a teenager for sure. Yeah, it was, we were a little bit more... So you saw the day-to-day intricacies that she was dealing with as a counselor in her community. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, you know, you just, you you see her get involved, see the work that goes into it and that kind of thing for sure. For sure. So, so the natural question to that is, um, I saw my father be, uh, become a nuclear reactor worker. I didn't want to go into that. What made you decide one day, you know what? I'm going to follow my mother's footsteps and get involved. I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that 2021 was the first time you put your name forward for an election, correct? 100%. Yeah. I so, am what was hap- I am yep. so what happened in 2021 that made you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to do what my mother did and get involved at the municipal level because you could have chosen school board, you could have chosen provincial politics, you could have chosen federal, but you at the end of the day chose municipal. So what was that decision based on? Well, I don't have a glamorous story. Um, so uh, the ward, the ward that I'm currently serving for, uh, it nobody put their name forward. The the councillor who had run previously decided that he had wanted to take a break. Um, so there was a by election coming up. There was just nobody was putting their name forward. So actually, the the councillor whose place I took uh, phoned me up and was like, you know, I think you'd really be a good fit. And it was, you know, I was like, okay let's do it let's try i mean what's the worst that could happen so that's had you thought about had you thought about getting involved prior to that or did it take that initial phone call for you to that light bulb in your head to go oh maybe i should it it definitely it definitely took the phone call i am a full-time student right now i am raising two daughters who are young and it is a full-time job so it wasn't on my radar at the particular time it happened but everything happens for a reason and i am no looking back now. I'm so glad I did it. So you get in in a by election because I just want to. Yes. Okay, so when yes. was the by election? Yes. Just after the 2021 election or prior to the 2021 general municipal election? Yeah. So I got the exciting phone call in November of 2021, and I was sworn in in December. So just a little bit after. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That is yeah, so- a couple months behind the rest, but still with the same time frame. It was, yeah, it was meant to be. So, so, so you're, we'll you're, you're coming up to almost halfway through your first term. Uh, by mm-hmm. the time this comes out in July, you'll be about a year and nine months from the election date that you were uh, elected in. What's been the biggest learning curve for yourself? Because there's a lot of people out there who know what a provincial politician does and knows what a federal politician does. You have the experience of having your mom to sort of be able to bounce ideas off and say, what does a municipal politician do? do, do. But for you, what was the biggest learning curve and what was the, the, the biggest eye-opening experience for you in this short period of time since you first got elected? Okay, we'll go get a coffee because there's a lot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, it 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 was a steep learning curve. I know more about a lagoon than I ever thought I was gonna need. I know a lot more about raiders and bridge maintenance. And you know, I think for me it was different because my mom is a town counselor, right? So when you switch to the you know, rural side of things, you, you look at different things, right? Your borders are bigger. You're, you're worrying about bridges. You're worrying about graders, you know, things that don't really translate that way. Right. So it, it was a huge learning curve. I feel like I've just kind of got enough confidence under my belt. Now it was a whole lot of learning, a whole lot of asking a lot of questions. And I think the Jack of all trades part of it right you have to know so much about everything you can't just go in and be like hey I'm just gonna do budget and only worry about budget or you know those kind of things it's it's a huge learning curve I I love how when municipal politicians I I ask that question municipal politicians they always say it's either lagoon wastewater sewage (laughs) I'm like these are not the sexy things that government is but here we are talking about them because they are a day-to-day thing that people rely on in your communities 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're definitely not glamorous. It's not all tea parties and shaking hands. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> yeah. Prior to running, because you get the call, you, 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 the counselor says you should run. You say, sure. Was there an issue that you said, if I get elected, even if I do get challenged or if it's just me and I get acclaimed either way, I want X to be my issue that I try to move forward. Or were there multiple issues going on in your community that you thought to yourself, maybe we can sort of address them in a different way because I'm going to bring a unique perspective to the council table, being a mother of two daughters, uh, being a student. Uh, I can imagine that your perspectives, particularly in Northern Alberta, because I used to live in that area and I know Traditionally, it's the, and I, I say this with respect to everyone who's listening to right, right now, and if you're about to send the email, send it to me, don't send it to the counselor, <laughs> the old white man club. And I say that with respect because you don't traditionally fit a rural politician's uh, uh, demographic there, counselor Kayla, uh, Kaylin. So for yeah. you, were, were there issues that you wanted to bring forward and different perspectives that you wanted to bring forward around that council table? You know, I don't know if there was like a specific issue. I just wanted to bring a, a different demographic to the table. You know, I'm I'm a young female mom of two kids, you know, and I, I want the future for them to be good. Right. And there was some things in the background, like thankfully my, you know, um, yeah, my my boards and committees, I guess, uh, kind of reflect my interests too, right? So mental health was a big one. Um, just getting our younger generation involved, right? Like we've, we're, you know, I'm 34 years old. I, I definitely am the youngest in most rooms that I sit in. There is no point in talking about, you know, not talking about the elephant in the room. Um, but it's just, I wanted to bring younger engagement and show younger people, you can get involved, you can do things, you can, you know, the, we have to step up or who's going to. So you you are speaking my love language, uh, Kaylin, right now <laughs> about getting the younger generation involved. Um, there's an apathy in this country, particularly with our younger youth. And I, 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 I'm in the same age demographic that you are. I'm a bit older, but we're in the same era. Um, how do you get more people involved? How do you how do you see yourself in this role as counselor in getting more people involved? Because uh, I, I looked at the municipal stats of the last election and the generation, our generation is slowly coming to the realization that they have to get involved. But it's still a boomer generation that is traditionally because it's the generation that says oh i've retired and i can give back to my community through elected politics at the municipal level why do you believe it's so important for younger generations to get involved and how do you see your role in advocating for that i think the world is changed by those who show up and, and maybe <laughs> if i show up maybe you know maybe somebody will say hey look like it's okay. Be brave, be fearless. You know, you got to be relentless sometimes, you know, it's, I, I mean, I definitely wasn't comfortable. I'm still not a hundred percent comfortable in every room that I go in, but you just, you know, fake it till you make it or something. I don't know you, but you can't, you can't change anything if you don't be brave and step forward. Right. So my, that's my hope. My hope is that people see that it's doable and a full-time student and mom of two young girls can do it. So show up. But it does take a toll on you because as a counselor, and I think you, you've you probably noticed this in the two years that you've been elected, you were working not a, just a full-time job, but you were working almost two full-time jobs as a counselor because you were paid for going to those meetings, but you have to go to events, you have to go to conferences, you have to be educated on what's going on in front of the, uh, the council meetings. So you have to uh, read your package before that. Um, it's a, it can take a toll on uh, the public, the personal life of a young person or even any person who gets involved. Have you found that balance of being mom for your two daughters, being counselor for your community, being an advocate for your community, but also just being Kalen from time to time? Yeah, uh, you, my husband would be a great person to ask this question too, because it has been a struggle to try and find the balance. It is definitely 
time consuming, but I mean, as cliche as it sounds, if you love what you do, it doesn't really feel like work. You know, the first year it was, there was a lot of, did I do the right thing? Did I get in over my head? Is this too much? Can I do this? And then now it's like, yeah, you can do it. You have to. And I feel like I'm I'm empowered because I feel like I have two young girls that I'm trying to be a role model for. And I'm trying to encourage them to be brave and I have to practice what I preach at the end of the day, if I'm just being honest, right? So you you find ways to make it work. And I think being a mom helps because you already wear 900 hats anyway. So what's another one? <laughs> I can imagine going to the grocery store is hard for you, though, because you want to go grab a carton of milk and come home and relax. But as a counselor, if someone stops you, you, you want to. It sound, it seems like, and I, I I could be wrong here, but it seems like you're very personable and you want to engage with your community who have elected you. I know rurally it's harder because there's a larger area that you have to cover in your ward, but you go to a grocery store, you'll probably run into someone from your community or from your ward who want to stop you. Um, how do you balance the the sort of the desire to engage with people, want to ask, get their opinions on issues, but also realize that you can't be stretched too thinly because you already have 900 other jobs as a mother? Yeah, I think I'm very fortunate because I'm I'm a small town. I'm born and raised here. So everybody knows me. So they kind of respect that boundary. But there are times when it's, you know, they'll catch me at the grocery store. Most just like to phone me. And that's okay, too. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a balance. I have to remind myself that it's okay to not answer the phone at 9 p.m. If somebody's calling me, that I can call them back the next day. You know, when the first year I felt... I had to take every call and I had to do everything and it had to be immediate. And those emails could not sit there for more than five minutes, you know, but now it's like, I realize, okay, the next business day is fine. And I don't need to stay up until 1am returning phone calls and emails. So it, it definitely is a balance game. You talk about mental health. You talk about the advocacy that you want to achieve around mental health in your community. Um, mental health starts with your own self as well, because you have to balance the needs and wants of your community. And you know, and I know that sometimes you have to disappoint people in your community because they want things that the community just can't achieve because of finances or just outside circumstances. Um, I want to start with the mental health aspect and then talk about the balancing aspect. Why is mental health so important to you? And why is advocating for mental health in a rural community like the County of Northern Lights such an important issue for uh, Kaylin? So mental health is personal to me. I struggle with my own mental health. Um, I have for a number of years. Um, and I just feel like when you're rural, I don't have all the supports or I didn't, you know, now it's I've learned to manage, but you know, you don't, you don't always have all the supports here. And so it was like, how, how do you, how do you stop this from happening? You know, and now we're starting to see things that we maybe didn't see 20 years ago. You know, I'm driving my kids past um, people who are experiencing homelessness that was not common when I was growing up here. And, you know, the, the times are changing. We have social media, people are mean, you know, I'm seeing it in my kids' schools they're mean and it's horrible. And, you know, so I'm very fortunate to sit on our mental health task force committee here. And so I'm so fortunate that that gets to be something that I get to participate in as a counselor. And one of those things that I say, hey, you know, like I maybe never would have been able to be involved had I not been a counselor, right? So these are how I can not just be a keyboard warrior, or talk on social media, right? I can actually help do something. So that part is huge. I'm going to ask a very odd question right now, and I do apologize immensely for this if it comes off weird. Um, rural communities are suffering more and more around mental health because, like you said, they don't have access to uh, services that larger municipalities like a Grand Prairie, like a, even a Peace River, even uh, Calgary, Edmonton, Medicine Hat what quantitative measures are you hoping to bring to the county around mental health while realizing that this is a provincial jurisdiction that you're talking about? And yes, municipalities are picking up the mantle to run with it, 
but what are you hoping to achieve within your first term? Or even if you only have one term and say, after one, four years, I'm done, let's move on. What are you hoping to achieve in the first four years around mental health? A conversation, an honest conversation. No dancing around the subject, no pretending it doesn't exist, an honest conversation. At the end of the day, you cannot fix a problem that you won't acknowledge. You can't, you, you, you just can't. And that is the simplest way that I can say it. I am very proud of the work that our committee is doing. And I hope, you know, while we're still relatively new, we were just struck up last October. So it's very new. I'm very thankful that um, our current MLA for our area is also the mental health and addictions minister now. So I'm hoping that we can just have some honest conversations because I don't think that there has been enough. Um, there's too much of it doesn't happen here. It can happen here. Um, it's not real. Take a pill. You know, th there's too much, too much around it. We need to have an honest conversation. I, I, I'm, flabbergasted that you, you you just said the words it doesn't happen here it sounds like nimbyism is alive even in issues that are not housing yeah. that people don't want housing in their neighborhood but it seems like oh mental health isn't an issue up here it never has been or it's not real so i give you credit for raising these issues and i give you credit for advocating for them uh, i know you say you want a conversation has the conversation started I, I think it has. I think that, um, you know, you can't argue science. You can't argue numbers. You can't argue statistics. Have so you seen I, social media, though? Because it seems like you uh, can argue whatever you want. Jokingly. Yeah, jokingly. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there because I don't want you to run away for coffee while I go off on a tangent about that. But <gasps> no. Can we go off on a tangent together about social media and how it's the downfall <laughs> of our society? Because I will be so in favor of that counselor. <laughs> Sure, sure. Off the record, right? No, um, but no, it's the this the statistics don't lie, right? And I think we um have done a homeless survey in our area, uh, more specifically, like closer to the peace over end of things, but the numbers are there. And I think that when the numbers come to the table, it's pretty hard to to argue them. I talked about the balancing aspect of the job because you as a counselor can't just look at your ward. You have to look at the county as a whole and you have to, and I hate to say pick the winners and losers on issues because everyone's issues are important to them. But you as a counselor have to look at the bigger picture and say, okay, John's road in ward four is going to get fixed compared to ward three's road in front of Sarah's house. And I, and I'm assuming, you know, these conversations like I do because I've been in these meetings where these conversations are happening. How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individuals in your community it's hard it, it's hard that's I struggled a lot in the first year and a bit of my term and how do you make them happy you know how do you help one without helping the other because it's usually always a give and take it's never easy um I think uh, you learn to ask good questions you learn to ask for you know the, the, th the tools that you need to make a good decision, you know, okay, you know, if there's a road that has a bad bridge that serves one person versus five, well, how do you, you know, you, it, but it, it's always hard at the end of the day. At, I mean, I'm human. I have a heart. I'm very empathetic. So at the end of the day, I always feel bad, but you just have to do the best with given the good information. But I think you have to ask for that good information and you have to ask the right questions so you can make a good educated decision. You're, you're, I, I'm so happy <laughs> I'm having this conversation as we're, the day we're recording this. Well, I feel um, less nervous, so it's good. <laughs> this, you, you, are, you are speaking, like you are setting up my questions quite easily, counselor. And I want to know this then. <laughs> How much weight do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to make sure that you are informed on what you're voting on, have engaged with the residents that need to be engaged, but are still open to a different opinion that might be heard at council? Because you have you have until the moment that 
uh, that vote is called to make your decision up. And you can take in all the information from administration, from residents, but your fellow counselor might one say something that you say, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And I've completely changed the way that I was going to vote. How in, how much weight do you put on yourselves to be informed, educated, but also open to change if things arise in a different way that you didn't think about? I think that's part of a, a younger generation. I think, you know, I think it's just I open-mindedness was something that, you know, was harped on me all the way through school. You know, you have to be open-minded. You have to think about the other things, you know, and I don't know that that was really in the curriculums before, but I put a ton of pressure on myself. I mean, I don't, I hope nobody ever looks at my agenda packages because they are so colorful and highlighted and marked up and I spend way a, a lot of time preparing because I don't know if it's just because I'm new and I feel like I don't want to look uninformed or, or if it's just who I am but I think it's more of who I am I just I I need all all the information to make a good decision so that I know when I lay my head down at night that I made a good decision how much but does I definitely oh go ahead I was gonna say but there's definitely times that I've read an agenda package and I'm like, okay, I'm passionate and this is my hill and this is what I'm going to do. And then I go in there and I go, oh, you know, I didn't think about that. Or, you know, and my, and my mind has changed, you know, and I think that I've had that impact on fellow counsel too. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I think that sometimes a different perspective is good too. Right. So I think co cohesively we're a pretty lucky bunch. We were pretty open-minded. So you you talk about being able to put your head in the, on the pillow at night after the decisions you make the decisions you make affect the people the day after municipal governments are the as scott pierce president of fcm would say the government of proximity you guys are the closest to the people the day to day decisions you make impact them the next day not a week not 10 months the next day um how big of your how much of your job is communicating to the residents the decisions you make so that way when you do lay your head on that pillow you know that the residents know why you've made the decision you've made but also why the county is doing what they're doing i think communication is huge especially when we have things like social media and you can be criticized in a heartbeat and I think we're more available. So they're going to see me at the grocery store. They're going to see me, you know, taking my kid to school, you know, so it's just, yeah, communication is huge. And I, I'm very proud. Like, I think that the county on a whole does a fantastic job at communicating those things. And I just do my best. And, you know, when there's a discussion that's uncomfortable or hard, I don't turn off my phone. I, you know, you face it head on. And I think that that's the best that you can do. I, I will say this, and I'm not sure who runs your communications department up there, but they are doing a fantastic job because uh, it seems like they're always communicating something. So give credence to them because I know in small towns, communications is often one of those overlooked, those small communities and rural communities, it's often overlooked, but give them credence to whoever's doing that. So there's my, will. there's my takeaway <laughs> from that. Um, we are yeah. coming up to the half hour mark because that's how long we've been chatting and it feels like it's only been 10 minutes uh, uh, Kaylin. Yeah. So I want to turn to sort of a good topic of conversation for me, which is tourism. I love <laughs> tourism. I love visiting <laughs> communities. I'm going to be up in Northern, uh, Northern County of Northern Lights later on this summer. So I will be stopping in and seeing your community firsthand because I have to make a pit stop in the town of Manning because I sat down with their mayor as well. Um, so as a tourist, as someone who has listeners and viewers from across Canada and around the world, if they're visiting the County of Northern Lights, what are some of the hidden gems that they need to see? Oh, where do I start? Okay, so, well, Did I'll I get bring another my, coffee? I'll bring, yeah, get another <laughs> coffee. I'll break my word first, because I don't think that Figure Eight Lake Provincial Park gets enough credit. It is a beautiful little gem, and it's always nice and quiet, because not very many people go there. <laughs> but there's some fabulous walking trails. The lake is beautiful, and that's fantastic. Um, if you're going up the Manning Way, you definitely have to go to the Twin Lakes. That is off the beaten trail, and not very many people go there, but it is beautiful uh yeah we're we're just really fortunate there's a huge variety of things we have a ton of awesome crown land but those those two hidden gems would be my my tip 
go go check out figure eight lake and twin lakes <laughs> after a stressful day after a long day at council meetings after a long day of doing your 900 other jobs as a mother being a mom for two kids um being a student where do you go to decompress within the county is there a local watering hole is there a coffee shop is there uh, a park that you can just go and sit in and 20 minutes later, all your worries, all your struggles have uh, just washed away from you? Uh, I come home. I got chickens <laughs> and, and they listen to all my problems and they make me feel better uh, or in the garden. Yeah, the, I, I come home. That's home is my piece. If I'm biased, but there is nothing like the County of Northern Lights to hang out in when you're done at a long day. So <laughs> But no, so, definitely my chickens. They listen to all my problems. <laughs> love it. Um, my last <laughs> last question for you, Caitlin, and it's the million dollar question. This is the important question that everyone needs to answer. And I don't want the canned answer. I want an honest to goodness answer. But it sounds like you're going to give it to me because of our conversation so far. In your opinion, what makes the County of Northern Lights such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? The people, the people, it, there is as cliche as it sounds, it takes a village to raise your kids. It takes a village to be successful. And, you know, we've faced some hard things, you know, we've had some forest fires, we've had some big things happen in our area and the power community never ceases to amaze me up here. You know, it's just, they're just good hearted people who just want to band together when somebody gets knocked down and it makes me so proud. Kaylin, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this today. Um, I, I mean this with all sincerity. We need more counselors like you because you have just cheered me up like there's no tomorrow. And um, you, you, you seem like someone who has the best interest in their community at hand. So thank you so much for doing this. It was an honor to sit down and talk about yourself and the County of Northern Lights. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with someone in real life. You'd be surprised at how much it can actually make a difference in someone's life. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. We'll be back again. Until then, just keep talking.